We welcome you all to our service today. Today is really in the calendar of the church two days, you might say. In the calendar of the church going back in history, this is known as All Saints Day. November 1st was a day that was very special within the life of the church. It celebrated not just those who had gone ahead in their lives of faith to heaven, and you think of the saints who are above, but it also included those who were here below, who through their faith in Christ Jesus are also cleansed of their sins. And that became a very important day within the church as that was commemorated. In fact, it was very close to what Christmas would be celebrated today. We have a Christmas Eve, and then we have a Christmas Day. Likewise, in those days, many years ago, some churches still celebrate this today, we had a All Saints Eve, which you know as Halloween, Holy Evening, and then that was in preparation for the next day, which was All Saints Day. So Halloween was not in the past what it is today. It was a very special festival within the church in preparation for celebrating this day, which is November 1st, as All Saints Day. Remembering how Christ has cleansed the saints, whether they are above or here below, in his blood. At the same time, you have the Reformation taking place on October 31st, which is a very important festival as the truth of God's word is restored again uh, to the church. And today, we are celebrating more the Reformation. This is known as Reformation Sunday. The closest Sunday to October 31st is usually celebrated that day. In our service today, you'll find this outlined in your service bulletin. You who have it online, I believe you also have the bulletin outlined for you today. It is a little bit different than what our normal service is. The whole service is written out here. There are parts that are explained. They are in the italics uh, sections. I will not be reading those in the service. Those are for you, for your own understanding of how things have developed historically at that time and what that part of the service means as far as our worship is concerned. But then we will follow the, the bolder print and the responses that are there. Some of the service will be sung, not so much by you, although you'll be singing the hymns. Uh, but at that time, the service was chanted for a variety of reasons. One of them, especially, is that the sung voice carries further than the spoken voice does. And in the bigger churches of Europe at that time, uh, the singing of the different parts of the liturgy was better heard because there were no microphones in those days. So that singing became a custom, and you'll hear some of that chanting today. You won't have to do that chanting. Uh, you'll just be singing the hymns for the day. When we get to the creed, which is on the fourth page of the bulletin, the hymns today, the creed especially, is something that Luther had written at that time. Actually, it comes from the time before Luther. This is a melody that is not the type of melody that we have today. So in order to help us in singing that, uh, Jane will play through the melody, and then I will sing the first stanza, and then we'll have you join in singing stanzas two and three that are in the hymnal. And uh, I'll also inform you at that time what we will do. Our beginning, the introit, was a time, the introit means the entrance. This was the time that the clergy came into the church. And in uh, more ancient times, that was sung by a choir. A hymn, a psalm verse is usually what it was, sung by the choir. <clears throat> Today we sing it as a congregational hymn, as Luther did. He opened up the congregation to the singing of hymns more than anybody else did in his day. And we'll join in the singing of hymn 280, Thy Strong Word. <laughs>
name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess to you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your punishment now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, who art the protector of all who trust in thee, without whose grace no one is able to do anything or to stand before thee, grant us richly thy mercy, that by thy holy inspiration we may think what is right, and by thy power may perform the same, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We now turn our attention to the scripture lessons for the day. If you care to follow along, you'll find them printed in the bulletin themselves at this time. The lessons were also sung or chanted, again, because that sung voice carried better within the churches of those days, and that was just the custom in that time. It's rather difficult to know how the chant was performed, because the chant would use different voices and different inflections for the different people that were included in their lesson for that day. In other words, Jesus would have the words spoken by Jesus would have one tone that was sung. The words that were spoken by Peter would have another tone that was sung in different ways. So this morning I'll be reading the lessons instead of singing them. We have two lessons for the day, the epistle lesson and the gospel lesson. Our first lesson is from the book of Galatians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Stand firm in faith because we are saved by Christ alone, is the theme that Paul is responding to. That is really the theme of the Reformation. We are saved by faith alone, by grace alone, by the word of God alone, by Christ alone, and to the glory of God alone. You'll hear all of those thoughts reflected in our lessons. From Galatians chapter 5. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, then, and do not allow anyone to put the yoke of slavery on you again. Look, I, Paul, tell you that if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, Christ will be of no benefit to you. I testify again to every man who allows himself to be circumcised that he is obligated to do the whole law. You who are trying to be declared righteous by the law are completely separated from Christ. You have fallen from grace. Indeed, through the Spirit, we, by faith, are eagerly waiting for the sure hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision matters. Rather, it is faith, working through love, that matters. Here ends the reading of the epistle. And in response to the first lesson, what was normally sung was a hymn to the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to guide us in that life of grace and faith. This morning we join in the singing of hymn number 190, We Now Implore God the Holy Ghost.
Our gospel lesson today is recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 10, beginning at verse 16, where the Lord is now sending his disciples out for the first time as his ambassadors to preach the gospel to the world. And he reminds them of some of the difficulties, but also the joys that they will experience. But many in the world would not receive that gospel in a good way. Luther and the reformers of that day certainly understood how that was translated at their time. We read in Matthew chapter 10. Look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves, so be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on guard against people. They will hand you over to councils, and they will whip you in their synagogues. You will be brought into the presence of governors and kings for my sake, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Whenever they hand you over, do not be worried about how you will respond or what you will say, because what you will say will be given to you in that hour. In fact, you will not be the one speaking, but the spirit of your father will be speaking through you. Brother will hand over his brother to death, and a father will do the same with his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all people because of my name, but whoever endures to the end will be saved. And when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. Amen, I tell you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Here ends the reading of the Gospel. The congregation may be seated. As we join together now in professing our faith with all Christians, this morning we do that in the words of hymn 271. Hymn 271. This is a hymn that was written by Luther for the specific reason of singing the creed, which was not done by the people of that day until he had advanced this. In the singing of this hymn for today, since it is a little bit more challenging, coming from the melodies of that time. Allow me first to sing the first stanza, and then if you who are here with us today and at home would join in the singing of stanzas two and three.
Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning we look at the lesson from Matthew chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. Shortly after the Reformation time, which would be 1517, but then also in the years following that, it took some time for the Jews of God's word to once again be restored uh, to the church. Luther died in 1546. And after that time, the celebration of the Reformation was something that the church wanted to take part in. There were different days that were assigned for that. Some of the days that some of the churches celebrated was the time of Luther's birth, which is in November, November 11th. No, excuse me, November 10th. Sometimes it was celebrated at the time of his death, which was in February, February 18th. But sooner or later, it came down to the 31st of October, because it was on that day that he challenged, you might say, the scholars of his day to debate these issues that were disturbing the church at that time and which were contrary to his word. Following his death, then October 31st began to be the date that was celebrated as the time of the beginning of the Reformation. Actually, it began before that, you might say. Um, but the 31st was celebrated. And our gospel lesson for today was the gospel lesson that was chosen uh, historically for the Reformation. So we read from Matthew chapter 11, verses 12 through 15. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. Christ Jesus, their fellow redeemed in our Lord. If I were to ask you to pick a word that to you best typifies or describes you in your life of faith, what word would you choose? One word that best describes you in your life of faith, what would you choose? I'll give you some suggestions in order to at least get you thinking. In his epistle to the Galatians, Paul writes and describes some of the fruits of faith that mark the life of a Christian. They are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Those are the fruits that the Holy Spirit places within the hearts of every believer in varying degrees. But you can also think of your life as marked by qualities that Jesus himself spoke about many times in his parables. Boldness, confidence, persistence in prayer, and so on. So, what characteristic of these or of the others that Scripture lays before us do you think best describes you in your life of faith? Did any of you consider forceful? Or how about violent? <laughs> violent? Christians aren't supposed to be violent people, are they? They are to be loving, they're to be gentle, they're to be kind, they're to be patient, they're to be self-controlled and long-suffering, aren't they? Those are the characteristics that we as Christians often pray that the Holy Spirit would place into our hearts and lives, aren't they? Yeah. But then what should we do with our text? When Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful people lay hold of it. Now, if you read the same text in the King James translation of the Bible, it would say, and the violent take it by force. Now, what could that mean? The violent take it by force. It could describe the people who hate Christ and oppose the gospel 
and turn on believers who seek to bring that gospel to them. Think of King Herod. He imprisoned John the Baptist and he beheaded him. Caiaphas blasphemed Jesus and then condemned him to death. Saul, before his conversion to the Apostle Paul, attacked Christians in order to simply wipe out Christianity. And Jesus warned in the Gospel lesson that we read today, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Be on guard against people. They will whip you. Brother will hand over his brother to death. A father will do the same. You will be hated by all people because of my name. You see, the kingdom of God suffers at the hands of violent men who forcefully oppose Christ. Yet, the violent taken by force could also describe the follower of Christ. As a Christian, you are to be relentless in grasping to yourself the eternal treasures of God's kingdom of grace. Martin Luther once said, Run with might, wrestle, and strive, for God does not want the weary, bored, satisfied souls, but those that are hungry and thirsty who press forward and struggle for it. So, are you forcefully grabbing to yourself, striving with all of your might, relentlessly pressing forward with that kingdom? When the gospel grabs hold of you like that, then a true reformation is taking place. That's the way it happened in the past. That's the way it worked, in forceful ways. For example, over 170 years ago, a determined figure hurried down the streets of Basel, Switzerland. It was a young Johannes Mühlhäuser, a founding father of the Wisconsin Synod. Just 26 years old, he scurried along in those streets, bent on seizing a waiting, a waiting task. What he was about to do was not to gain worldly recognition for himself, nor was it going to bring him any amount of wealth, but it was a task that was going to change the course of his life and that of the church. God was about to take him on his journey of his life's work over 5,000 miles on a journey that passed through New York on to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. His purpose that was given by those who sent him was to found Lutheran congregations in the New World. Now to found a church in those days, this is the middle 1800s, let alone a Lutheran church, was no small task because the greatest amount of American society at that time, it is said, leaned on human sense and reason in order to survive in the wild new land. And others, had no religious sense at all, let alone any faith. Spiritual life on the American frontier was in a sad state of affairs, and there were very few pastors. So the task of bringing the gospel was no easy matter. Added to that, in the middle 1800s, a severe cholera epidemic swept through our land, especially within the cities. Thousands die, just like today. What should the minister do? Should he hide? Should he flee like so many had? But if he did, who would take care of the spiritual needs of the sick and the dying? How many souls would then be lost for eternity? No, men like Mühlhäuser, you might say, forced themselves to stay to proclaim this gospel. There were others like that, like Jakob Addison, who was one of the founding fathers of the old Norwegian synod from which sprang the present-day Evangelical Lutheran synod. He came to America because the Norwegian settlers at that time pleaded for help. 
He was called to serve three congregations in a northern Wisconsin city, that's of Manitowoc, as well as eight to ten missions in between from Manitowoc down to Milwaukee, which was a distance of some 120 miles. Think about that. One man serving 13 groups of people that were hungry to hear the gospel. This was pioneer work of the most trying kind that demanded a bold and a burning love for the God, kingdom of God. Confidence in faith and a relentless willingness to exert oneself Incessant travel on horseback, 30 to 50 miles a day along the rough shores of Lake Michigan, or on silent trails that led through trackless forests at the time, often in the cold of winter, to bring the gospel of Christ to souls who needed the Savior. There were others with names, like Walther, Heineke, Body, Koren, Preuss, and above all, Martin Luther. You can't forget October 31st, 1517, when with great determination, Luther marched through the streets of Wittenberg, his purpose to nail the 95 Theses on the church door at that time, eagerly calling for a spiritual debate on the abuses of the selling of indulgences and other abuses of that day within the church. Or how about four years later, in the year 1521, when a stalwart Luther stood alone before the emperor at a place called Worms. Eager as he thought was the chance to defend the saving doctrines of the scriptures about which he had written. Instead, he was ordered to retract and to be silent, to get rid of all the sermons and all the books that he had written to show that men were saved by Christ alone through faith alone. How could he take that back? For the gospel had grabbed hold of him and it would not let him go. How could he lose it or allow the truth of salvation to be stifled? As he stood before that council of the rulers of the day, with ever-growing forcefulness, he gave his response. Unless I'm convinced, by the scriptures, I cannot and I will not repent. My conscience is bound by the word of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. See, boldly, forcefully, you might say even in violence to themselves, those men went forth against all odds, just like John the Baptist, preaching repentance and faith. They founded church after church. They wrote book after book. They preached sermon after sermon from Europe to Asia to Africa to Australia to this new world of America and beyond. They fought for God's truths. They organized synods, schools, and seminaries to carry this gospel forward. But it's not really the men and their lives that we celebrate today. It is the gospel of which we are not ashamed, for it alone is the power of God unto salvation to all that believe. When that good news of a Savior who restores us to God by his work is heard, it grabs hold of the heart and it will not let go. It works in Christians to become forceful. Dare we even say violent people as we eagerly and joyfully grab hold of it and let nothing stop us in advancing that saving proclamation. Men, women, and children with this burning zeal snatching to themselves the kingdom of God by faith. That's the way that you and I are to be in our lives of faith. That's what happens when the gospel really grabs hold of you and the spirit forcefully goes to work in people's hearts. You could call it a loving violence that makes our Lord smile. That's the way it forcefully worked in the past. And it works that way in the present, too. Look around. 
around you wants at the state of the world today. How godless does it appear, even in the midst of this pandemic? How often do you hear people, how often do you hear any of our leaders call upon God to overcome this epidemic for us? How often do you hear our leaders urging our people to return their hearts to faith in Christ? For God is disciplining us. And what about the church? What's that like? Doesn't look so good either. Violent men and women in sheep's clothing are trying to destroy it and the pure teachings of the scriptures again. Perhaps the Apostle Paul described this best when he wrote in one of his letters. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Do you think that's a fair description of the spiritual life of many today? Are we in need of a godly violence and loving forcefulness that was prominent in the past? Where is that strength today? Some think that the strength of the kingdom or the church is going to be found in numbers. Some think it's found in wealth. Others think in a winsome personality. But the power of God's kingdom is not found there. And no one shall ever be saved because one's church was a large one or a wealthy one, or socially influential, or because its members were friendly or kind. You will never save a soul by pursuing those means alone, but you will save them by faithfully preaching God's word of grace in Christ Jesus. So it was that Paul admonished, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For a time is coming when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Preach the word that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith, for the just shall live by faith. Freedom by God's grace through faith. Redeemed from sin, death, the power of the devil, and any evil that plagues us, only in the Savior. It's God's good news of forgiveness and life that grabs hold of hearts. And therein lies the power of salvation today, just like it did in the past. In the message of Christ crucified, Christ alone. So by God's help, we are to be loving, lovingly forceful, like the people of old, in grabbing these saving truths for ourselves and in boldly proclaiming this gospel to others. For men are saved by grace alone, by faith alone, through the Holy Scriptures alone, by Christ alone. And as the faithful proclamation of that gospel worked forcefully in the past, it still works that same way in the present and it will be the same in the future. It is the only means through which the soul is saved. And when that happens, then a true reformation does take place as the gospel grabs hold of you and you won't let it go. God grant that in our lives of faith and in the lives of faith for many, for Jesus' sake. Amen. 
At this time, the Church of the Reformation in the 1500s would have their prayers of the day. Quite frequently, the prayers were just read from the pulpit itself. A very special type of admonition to the congregation was given before the Lord's Prayer was said. It explained what the different petitions of the Lord's Prayer was, were, and why we would pray them. Today we include that in our prayers for the day, but before we even begin with that, since in the days that lie ahead, our nation will be electing its officials, we should pray on behalf of our nation and behalf of that election that the, the Lord's will would be carried out. And in whichever way it goes, that will be the Lord's will for his people. And we ask him to guide everything for us. We pray. Lord God, Lord of nations, you have made us citizens both of your kingdom of grace and of the earthly nation in which we live. You have placed us under a government that gives us the privilege of choosing the leaders who govern us. As another election time approaches, help us to appreciate and to use this privilege. Bless our nation through the election of honest and responsible officials. Watch over us each day with your almighty protection and your unfailing love. And give to us the confidence that whatever takes place will be according to your gracious will for your people. Be with us now and guide us in this. For Jesus' sake we pray. As we approach to receive the Lord's Sacrament today, we will join together in the prayer that our Lord himself has taught us. But let us first of all think of what this prayer means in our lives of faith. Dear friends in Christ, since we are here assembled in the name of the Lord to receive this Holy Testament, we admonish you, first of all, to lift up your hearts to God, to pray with us in the Lord's Prayer, as Christ our Lord has taught us and graciously promised to hear us. That God, our Father in heaven, may look with mercy on us, his needy children on earth, and grant us grace so that his holy name would be hallowed by us, and all the world, through the pure and the true teaching of his word, and the fervent love of our lives, that he would graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby his precious name is being blasphemed and profaned, that his kingdom may come to us and expand, that all transgressors and they who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom be brought to know Jesus Christ, his Son, by faith, and that the number of Christians may be increased, that we may be strengthened by his spirit to do and to suffer his will, both in life and in death, in good and in evil things, and always to break, slay, and sacrifice our own wills. That he would also give us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust that he will provide for all our needs. That he would forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors, so that our hearts may rest and rejoice in a good conscience before him, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. That he would not lead us into temptation, but help us by his Spirit to subdue the flesh, to despise the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. And lastly, that he would deliver us from all evil, both of body and soul, now and forever. All those who earnestly desire these things will say from their hearts, Amen, trusting without any doubt that it is yea and answered in heaven as Christ has promised. Whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you shall receive it, and we, you will. And we now ask the congregation here to please rise and join with me in the prayer the Savior taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Secondly, I admonish you in Christ that you discern the testament of Christ in true faith that we are about to receive. And above all, take to heart the words wherein Christ imparts to us his body and his blood for the remission of our sins. That you remember and give thanks for his boundless love, which he proved to us when he redeemed us from God's wrath, sin, death, and hell by his own blood. And that in this faith you externally receive the bread and wine that is his body and his blood as the pledge and guarantee of this. In his name, therefore, and according to the command that he gave, let us use and receive the testimony. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped and gave it to them, saying, Take drink, this is the blood of the covenant which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Following the consecration of the elements, a hymn called the Sanctus was sung. Isaiah was the prophet who did see Seated above the Lord in the majesty, high on a lofty throne in splendor bright, the train of his robe filled the temple quite. Standing beside him a word to seraphim, Six wings, six wings, he saw on each of them. With twain they hid, and all their faces clear. With twain they hid their feet in the reverent fear. And with the other twain they flew about. One to the other loudly raised the shout. Holy is God, the Lord of Sabaoth. Holy is God, the Lord of Sabaoth. Holy is God, the Lord of Sabaoth. Behold, his glory filleth all the earth. Thy angels cry, made beams and lintels shake. The house also was filled with clouds of smoke. Now we invite you, our community members, to come forward to receive the Lord's Supper. Please follow the direction of our ushers. We'll take about four or five or six of you at a time. And again, if you would distance yourself uh, from each other, just in front of the front pews.
Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given to death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. And now may this is true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins, strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission of your sins. Now may this is true body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of all sins. Strengthen you and confirm you in that true faith to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.